Well, good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to the second of our Green Building series. Uh, we're excited to have a, a great uh, crowd uh, listening. Uh, my name is John Eichen. I am the Executive Director of Rochester A Builders. Uh, just a few housekeeping things. Uh, we'll have time for questions at the end. So if you have questions at any point in time, you can type them in the question box or in the chat. Uh, we'll be monitoring those. So anytime you have a question, go ahead and type it in, but we'll probably save the questions until uh, we get to the end. So thank you for attending and uh, Megan Gallagher, I'm going to turn it over to you. Okay, thank you everyone for joining. My name is Megan Gallagher and I serve on the Green Building Committee for Rochester Area Builders. We recently kicked off a webinar series that we plan on hosting every other month at this time. This will be our second webinar in the Green Building series. The first was on a case study on a home built earlier this year in Southwest Rochester. The homeowners wanted to build a zero energy ready home so that after installing solar panels to their roof, they will offset all of their energy consumption with that renewable energy. Mike Allen Holmes was the builder. And in that webinar, he discussed the details that went into building that home above and beyond the energy code to make it extremely energy efficient. Today, we will be discussing another home built in Rochester earlier this year. However, this project is unique in the fact that it was purchased by First Homes Properties, a Rochester Area Foundation initiative. To achieve their goals, First Homes worked closely with a builder, architect, and energy rater. Today, we will hear from Justin Voss with First Homes, Alyssa Fordham Vott with CRW, Denny Eink with Maplewood Homes, and Brandon Vott with XRG Concepts to discuss the design aspects, modeled performance, and lessons learned. As John stated, any questions can be answered, entered into the chat at any time and will be answered at the end. And with that, I will turn it over to Justin Voss with First Homes. Hey, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, it's good to be here. I'm gonna give you a little background on uh, what First Homes is and uh, uh, what the Community Land Trust is. <clears throat> uh, so, First Homes is a nonprofit organization uh, here in Rochester, and we're under the Rochester Area Foundation. And uh, the First Homes program was established around the year 2000 um, after some mid to late 90s community identified needs around needing more units of affordable housing. Um, so in those early days, um, First Homes got um, involved on the new construction side and they'd come to the deal with uh, when I say come to the deal come to the closing uh, with um, a subsidy which would lower the price or lower the uh, the amount that a homeowner would need to take out for a first mortgage um, and then first homes was also involved with um, sort of in the background on some larger multifamily uh, projects uh, in terms of giving out some grants and and some uh, very low interest loans. Um, so sort of a quick recap on the timeline that First Homes has gone through here this last 20 years. So we, we were doing a lot of new construction um, in that first uh, seven year time frame. Um, so like I was mentioning, just basically a builder would build a home and then we'd come in at, at, uh, at closing and provide that investment. And uh, um, and then things shifted a little. Um, 2007 to 10, 2010, um, there was a there was a uh, a large push to help revitalize Kutsky neighborhood, and First Homes did a lot of rehab in that neighborhood. Um, and then um, from there, we jumped off and and kept rehabbing homes um, in some of the other neighborhoods that sort of surround downtown. Um, and then 2015 um, to up to about the last year uh, was more maintenance mode. So we were just focusing on resales of those community land trust homes. And, um, and then 2020 hit and we ramped back up big time. Um, so we've, we built 14 new construction uh, units this year and we're in the process of three rehabs. So uh, we've added 17 units into the uh, uh, CLT this year. 
which is which is awesome. We're up to 225 homes in the Community Land Trust. Um, we've completed about 200 resales, um, sort of since the program started, and um, 25 of those was this year. So uh, it's been busy. And uh, first homes this year um, jumped into its first NOAA project, which is uh, naturally occurring affordable housing. So we purchased the 36 unit, all two bedroom um, Center Street Village apartment building. Um, so I'll give you a quick rundown of what the Community Land Trust is or how it works. Um, so we have um, you know, a chunk of money that we're investing into a property and we uh, have a ground lease that is sort of a contract between us and the home buyer. Uh, so the home buyer, they own their own home just like um, you know any other piece of uh, property, um, but we retain ownership in the land and that protects um, the money that uh, First Homes brings into the deal. Um, and then when, when it's time for that person to move or sell that home, uh, we have a special resale uh, process where we use you know an appraisal based uh, resale process or a formula and um, it's figured out how the equity is shared between the homeowner and um, and then it kept in the property to to keep that affordability down um, and um, it's a great program because it it balances wealth building for the home buyer um, but also that affordability is preserved over the long term um, so to date, uh, since the program started, we've we've uh, benefited a little over 900 uh, individuals, um, and that's um, Rochester. But then going out further, Olmstead County, we actually serve about a 35 mile radius. So um, we're in Pine Island, Plainview, Dover, um, St. Charles. So just to name a couple, there there's more that I'm leaving out. Um, so that's that's a little bit about First Homes and its background. Um, if you want to do the next slide, um, thank you. Um, we've got some other, I guess, smaller programs that were that were um, operating in terms of uh, down payment assistance, uh, or we call them gap loans. So um, if somebody um, maybe doesn't have that 3% or 5% um, down payment that, that the bank is requiring, we're able to do a long-term, um, often deferred um, gap loan um, for little or very, or no interest in some cases. Um, First Homes is involved out in Zumba Ridge Estates um, with a manufactured uh, home. There's a co-op out there, that's a pretty cool, uh, program out there where everybody um, is partial owner of the, the entire um, park or neighborhood, and then, like I mentioned, we're doing uh, we're doing some affordable rental now too with Center Street Village. So, uh, getting to why you guys are are interested in this. Um, our initial our initial concept for this project was to build a net zero home at an affordable price, um, hitting a buyer that would be at or below 80% of area median income, um, and for that home to be within 10 blocks of downtown, so walkable, um, ideally. Um, but then through the process of the design and funding applications, um, this objective was redefined or synthesized down. Um, and uh, so we got down to where we thought we would build a four bedroom, two bath slab on grade, meeting enterprise green communities standards in a downtown core neighborhood um, and ideally selling it for around 175,000. Um, so the, the timeline for this project um, it's been a three-year process and to end. Um, it started out in May of uh, 2017 with some prototyping with CRW, um, 
mocking up different floor plans. Um, and then in 2018, we acquired the land. We demolished the house that you can see that yellow house there, that upper right uh, photo, um, because it was it was not salvageable. Um, and then we uh, we applied and ultimately secured grant funding from Minnesota Housing Finance Agency. And then in 2019, we um, we were ready to to go out for requests for proposals. We actually had to do two rounds. Um, and our initial round was was a bit over budget, and so we we just did you know back to the drawing board and and tweaked some things that we'll get into later. What some of those trade offs and compromises were, and then um, then in that second RFP, we ultimately were looking to be within our budget and um, started working with with Maplewood, um, and then in in December of last year then we we broke ground and thanks to the generous financing terms from the coalition for rochester area housing um, they provided construction financing um, and then we wrapped things up uh, june this this june of this year um, and uh, quickly found a buyer and they closed and um, they are very very happy with with the home um, and uh, I guess with that, I would like to turn it over to Alyssa. Thanks, Justin. Um, as Justin mentioned, uh, the mm -hmm. original objective for the home project was to build it to net zero energy ready. Um, basically what that means is it's a home that can produce as much of its own energy through renewable energy sources um, as it consumes. And the ready part is that it's not incorporated up front that equipment for the solar or wind or whatever it may be would come um, down the road um, and so while we weren't exactly sure that that's where we'd end up uh, with the energy energy ready home um, it was a goal that we wanted to strive for knowing that any step um, in the direction of beyond uh, typical construction uh, would be a step in the right direction um, and so, um, as Justin also mentioned, um, MHFA had a grant um, and it was applied for and they, and they received it. And so that added the additional requirement of uh, designing for a home that would meet the Enterprise Green Communities criteria. And if you're not familiar, um, it's a checklist of sustainability criteria, very similar to um, LEED or leadership in energy and environmental design. Um, it has some mandatory uh, requirements, but also some additional credits that you can um, achieve as well. So we implemented both the Enterprise Green Communities criteria and then principles from Net Zero Energy Ready uh, design into this home, specifically in these uh, basic categories, site design, building design, energy efficiency, water usage, and healthy living environment. Um, so here you see an aerial of the site at 421 9th Avenue Northeast here in Rochester. Um, and even though the project uh, or the plot of land was purchased, um, so it wasn't really um, selected after, um, um, as part of the design process, um, the location of the site does contribute to the sustainability of the project. Um, it has existing infrastructure because there's a house there before, it's in a neighborhood, there's sewer and water connections ready. Um, it has uh, walkability, so parks and amenities are, are close by. Um, and it was also a previously, previously developed site or um, infill development. We incorporated the use of native and non-invasive plants that will reduce the owner's watering needs. Um, the orientation of the home is east and west, which provides uh, south, southern facing roof slopes for future solar, solar panels. And the driveway and the garage are intentionally located on the south side of the home um, which provides uh, winter sun exposure for ice melting. 
The, the home is designed as 1,120 square, square feet building footprint. Um, on the main level, we have two bedrooms and one bath along with laundry. The lower level was intentionally left unfinished to allow for a lower initial construction cost and also future flexibility and sweat equity potential for the homeowner. It, it does, uh, the lower level does have the potential for uh, two bedrooms, one bathroom and a family room. The home was designed with open concept to minimize framing and construction costs and also to make the home feel larger and the, that open living space feel larger. And the footprint was designed on a two foot module that will help to conserve building materials. As I mentioned, the orientation of the home is east to west. So we put windows on the south uh, so that will let in uh, some, some of the sunlight to help with solar heat gain and um, would ultimately hopefully reduce the heating load in the winter. But it also will provide natural light into that open space to reduce the need for electrical lighting. And while it's not required by enterprise green communities nor um, the net zero energy ready home, the home is aesthetically designed to fit into the scale and character of the neighborhood, um, which is not entirely about the sustainability of the home, but the sustainability of the community as a whole and the neighborhood fabric. So we intentionally designed it to be a small modern bungalow with some traditional roof lines and also have a front porch that allows for neighbor interaction um, while also providing some summer shading. I also wanna mention that the home does, re does meet the requirement for visitability which means it allows for easy access for visitors with mobility impairments. So the main entry of this home has no obstacles, zero steps from street to front door. Uh, all the doors are a minimum of 32 inches clear. And um, the main level bathroom has clear floor space adequate for somebody with mobility concerns. Um, energy efficiency, uh, from, a, from an energy efficiency standpoint, the home is required to meet Energy Star for homes, and Brandon will talk a little bit more about that later. Um, all the appliances are Energy Star, uh, all the lighting is 100% LED, and uh, as I mentioned, the passive solar um, heat gain uh, with, the, with the window placement allows for the sun to come in and warm that space and in the wintertime and then in the summertime, we have overhangs that help to shade those spaces and reduce that, that heat gain. Um, and we also have the potential for the future solar panels. Plumbing system is all low flow and water sense fixtures, reducing the water consumption of the home. Um, from a healthy living uh, environment, the health of building occupants should always be considered in every design. Um, but is required in most sustainability uh, design criteria like the enterprise green communities. Um, our approach, uh, we approach this through mold prevention with durable materials and durable floor surfaces that are moppable, such as uh, LVT or luxury vinyl tile. Uh, we have no or low VOC paints, coatings, sealants and adhesives. And a VOC is essentially a volatile organic compound, which just means it's a chemical that off gases into our homes and spaces that are harmful to our health and can cause things like headaches, respiratory issues, uh, dizziness, or sometimes go undetected. Uh, we also include low to no formaldehyde composite wood products, which is a VOC. And pest management um, measures that eliminate insects and other pests intrusion and damage to the home by sealing all wall and floor joints and penetrations. And last but not least, uh, natural ventilation, which seems like a no-brainer, but um, incorporating windows that are on opposing sides of the homes to get good cross ventilation and natural um, fresh air. Um, and this will help to expel any lingering odors or VOCs that may come from 
any products you might have, including furniture, rugs, et cetera. Um, and so that's a brief overview of just kind of some of the design um, criteria we had in mind when we when we initially were looking at this this home. Um, so with that, uh, I think I'm going to turn it over to Justin from First Homes and Denny Eind from Maplewood Homes, and they can talk a little bit more about the construction systems and their approach uh, to the project in the field. Thanks, Alyssa. Um, I know we were having some technical difficulty with Denny. Is he on? Is he on? So can you hear me from this point? Yes. Thanks, Denny. Go okay. Ahead. So, so the efforts on to this home were uh, minimal in comparison to the results that we received. Um, so part of what we were involved with as a builder was to furnish and follow some uh, techniques that were proven in the past on Energy Star homes. Um, in, like I mentioned, pretty simply uh, following these uh, framing techniques in particular, the advanced framing techniques involve um, elimination of as much framing as we can do in the field uh, to prevent the thermal bridging transmission of heat loss through stud areas whenever possible. So some of these areas are where the interior wall meets the exterior framing construction is to do either a ladder uh, framing or just put a flat two by six in there rather than putting several studs to uh, have the studs in line with the rest of the wall framing. So the gain with this is to eliminate that thermal bridging through that wood member, but rather have the insulation uh, take do its job through the cavity. The other area that's important to watch would be to on the exterior corners uh, to do more of a California type corner or uh, follow the framing advanced framing techniques. So what we're gaining by doing this is eliminating the trouble spots uh, of any kind of transmission through that wall system. Uh, so this is tested uh, later uh, by uh, HERS scores or achieving the lower HERS score. And we were able to do that, getting this uh, performance of this home down to a 42 in a HERS index. Um, I think uh, Brandon will probably talk about the meaning of HERS index for people that don't understand that. But it's a measure of uh, the performance of this home. Uh, some other areas that we uh, do watch, and this is kind of done by uh, several inspections throughout the building process, uh, typically in the framing stage and the insulation stage, and then and the final. Uh, there are a couple other areas that we watch um, for deficiencies, trying to eliminate, uh, if you can, uh, the recess lights in the ceiling are a big heat loss that we found throughout uh, doing these. Um, inspections and then in the end result. So uh, it was it was a fun project to work with by um, all the people that were involved with this. Uh, and I we actually through the building process we received quite a few different compliments from the neighbors that were walking by watching the project and all the people that visited throughout the process. Um, mostly what they loved about uh, the process was cleaning up the neighborhood and providing a nice um, home for uh, somebody that can get into a home um, more efficiently. So with that, uh, I think I'll turn this back to Justin and see if uh, there's any other questions. Thanks, Danny. Um, yeah, I'd like to talk about some of the costs. Um, I'm not sure if there was a slide on, on that, um, but I'll jump into it. So I'm um, sure you all are, are curious. So like how much did this house cost and what did it sell for? And oh, there we go. Thank you for getting that slide up. Um, so there so there you see some of it. Um, so our total development cost. So that's everything, um, the land, the demolition, the cost of construction, uh, the closing cost, the realtor cost, um, 
just everything that went into it was $291,000. And uh, at the end of it, we had an appraisal, um, which gave us a market value of $235,000. Um, and all that, this wouldn't be possible without the, the generous grant and uh, time and effort, um, donated time and, and volunteer time um, by many of those that, that contributed to the project. Um, so we did uh, we did use about $106,000 um, in grant funding. Um, and um, I just want to underscore that this is a one-time investment. Um, this isn't going to just support the first family that moves into this house. Um, we have homes, you know, that are creeping up on that 20 year uh, age that are in the community land trust and they've been sold two, three, um, maybe even a fourth time now in a couple of cases. Um, and so the, you know, this one time funding um, or investment gets recycled um, and is protected through the resale process. Um, so at the, you know, in the end, uh, First Homes has equity in these homes. Um, and uh, so it's just, it's really great. Um, it's just a win-win. Um, ultimately, the, the buyer for this house, for this 421 Ninth Avenue nor Northeast house um, was at 50% of area median income. So um, we did sell it for $185,000. Um, and um, as you can see, um, what our cost per square foot. So we we debated a little of how to <laughs> how to calculate that, but we felt like um, what was maybe the the best way to compare was it was just this is just the construction cost. So that 96.74 per square foot um, was just the cost of construction. So um, it didn't include acquiring the lot or demo, uh, demo, de demoing the home um, or some of those soft costs, like I mentioned, or the garage. Um, so, um, yeah, and uh, like I mentioned earlier, we did have a sort of two rounds of, of RFPs um, and with Denny's help and um, Alyssa and Brandon, uh, we identified some areas where we could do some value engineering between that that first RFP where we were over budget to to making it more realistic. Um, so we um, we redesigned the garage foundation and framing and cut out insulation for the garage. Um, we changed some of the structural uh, details um, and wall framing in the basement. Um, we changed our flooring um, finishes. We went from a, a polished concrete floor on the on the main level to um, the luxury vinyl plank flooring. Um, we changed the siding and the roof design. We went from a um, what well, we had a room and attic type roof truss to where we had that second level for uh, more bedrooms and bathrooms, but. Uh, we ultimately scaled that back to just a hip roof. Um, and then we cut out some foam insulation and just stuck to more traditional um, bat, uh, fiberglass bats. Um, so with all that, there were some compromises and um, I guess trade-offs, like we weren't able to, to build that four bedroom, two bath home like we initially set out to do. Uh, it just wasn't feasible with the level of funding and the price point that we wanted to be at for um, for making it affordable for somebody to buy. Um, and then unfortunately, we didn't get to do some cool things on the uh, utility side. Um, we wanted to do a, you know a, an all electric type mechanical uh, package with a, a mini split heat pump, a, you know air air source uh, heat pump. Um, and electric hot water heat and um, and some of those changes we had to make on the garage meant that um, that wouldn't be able to be like a future um, accessory dwelling unit or an ADU um, so that's a little bit about um, some of the costs
turn it over to Brandon. Thanks, Justin. Um, thanks for uh, yeah having us today. And I guess I'm going to kind of start off with, uh, um, well, I'm going to be covering the home performance. But I'm going to start off with the HERS index here, just give you kind of a background on that, and then talk about Energy Star for new homes, what that is, um, and just kind of follow up with um, how this home performed and, and maybe just a few takeaways that we saw um, from the energy side of things. Um, so for those of you who don't know what the HERS index is, it's uh, the home energy rating system. Um, a lot of times we use the miles per gallon analogy uh, with one major difference. Uh, the lower your score, the more energy efficient your home is. So um, you can see here um, in the middle, there's a graphic. Uh, it shows kind of where uh, existing homes are so homes that are you know 20 30 40 years old older homes I can also see a reference home there which is set to the 2006 IECC energy code um, and then you can see kind of all the way down the scale there you get to see the the zero energy homes. so that's how the, the index is kind of made up and this is a national thing too so it's not um, specific to Minnesota or anything like that and you can also see um, over the last several years our average score for homes in our area and how that's um, gone down. Um, and then also there's a chart there that kind of tells you um, how our once we started tracking how airtight homes are, which is the ACH 50 column. Um, that's a measure of how airtight a home is, and that's a, a variable in the HERS score. Um, you can see. Um, what we're seeing for tightness of homes. Um, the HERS index itself can actually be used to compare a home versus another home. So um, you can actually look at a, a thousand square foot two bedroom home and compare that to a larger home. Uh, larger homes typically are more efficient, but that number is comparable between homes. Um, and the, the HERS score itself stays with a house. So the home sold that that her score you know continues to be with the home um, and as you make improvements to your home you can actually update your her score as well and see what the the impacts of your improvements are uh, you can go to the next slide Alyssa um, so energy star for new homes um, energy star has evolved um, and continues to evolve um, since I've been doing this for 10 years, um, this particular home uh, was required to meet Energy Star for New Homes certification through the Green Communities criteria. Um, but the certification itself really is a process that really forces and, and I guess focuses on energy efficiency and durability and forces um, the people involved to take that stuff into consideration um, from the design phase through construction. Um, so that the primary like team members that are involved um, would be like a home builder um, so in this case Maplewood Homes uh, and, and to be involved they actually had to complete an online orientation and become an Energy Star partner um, an energy rater which is um, who we are um, we also had training that we had to complete and become an Energy Star partner um, carpenters framers people that are involved with the construction um, of the house in the field, um, obviously are affected by this. Um, Denny mentioned advanced framing. So they are, uh, they're gonna have to understand what that means and learn new ways of framing a home. Um, insulators as well, um, you know, they're gonna be required to a little bit higher standard of how their insulation is installed, not necessarily what they're insulating or how, what they're insulating with. Um, and then HVAC, uh, HVAC subcontractors, um, they're probably the um, one team member that probably has the biggest learning curve and they're leaned on quite heavily in Energy Star. Um, they have to be a member of a, an oversight organization that's approved by Energy Star. Um, they're required to do additional design um, that maybe they're not used to doing. Um, and we'll touch on a few more things too, but they are also a very vital member um, in, in person involved in getting this certification. So Energy Stars basically got two requirements. Um, the first is that their HERS score has to meet a target 
that's set based on the size of a home square footage and bedrooms. Um, so that's um, a pretty straightforward measurement. Um, if you don't meet that target, you cannot, com you cannot get the certification. Uh, the other requirement is the completion, or I'd probably say compliance, uh, with five additional checklists. Um, so the first checklist is a, um, it's called the Raider Design Review Checklist, and that checklist is going to verify that all those team members are meeting their credentials, um, and it's also going to um, have the Raiders, our, us, uh, review the HVAC checklist to make sure that that was completed um, and actually filled out. And that's not meant to be sarcastic, but a lot of times um, it's easy to miss stuff or um, not understand what that checklist means. So we're more or less verifying that it's been completed. Uh, the second checklist is the Raider Field Checklist, which covers installation of insulation, the framing that Denny mentioned, um, air sealing uh, techniques, air barriers, um, the HVAC system itself, how that was installed. Um, again, it's not really a verification, it's more we're grading quality of installation. So we're making sure certain things have been done um, that are gonna impact energy and in most cases, durability of those systems and the home. Um, we're also gonna be doing some additional testing as part of that checklist that we don't typically do. Um, the, the third checklist is that HVAC design report. Uh, we encourage contractors to get that done sooner than later. Um, but it forces them to take um, a little bit more in-depth design approach than what they're doing on a typical home. Um, it covers basic design inputs, but it also uh, requires them to do a, a manual J or something similar, which is a, a method for determining heating and cooling load calcs. So um, we know that this high-performing home is actually being sized correctly and not based on, you know, the last 10 years of what that particular contractor is used to doing. Um, the fourth checklist, which technically isn't required, but um, we still encourage contractors to do it. it, it it's uh, the HVAC commissioning checklist, which um, asks the HVAC contractor to go in and, and measure um, and test what they've installed and, and basically check over their own work. Um, the fifth is a uh, more of a um, not really a checklist, but a guideline for builder, and it deals with water management systems. And um, in our area, in our um, climate and geography, we're pretty much um, meeting this as a as a minimum standard as it is. So there isn't really a lot that goes into that above and beyond what we're already doing. So <clears throat> excuse me. So when it's all said and done, Energy Star certified homes. Um, I guess I kind of try to summarize this as has an integrated team approach um, as it relates to the heating, cooling, ventilation um, with an accurate and appropriate design for that house. Um, and a lot of times that includes meetings, kickoff meetings beforehand, um, and really just opening communication channels so that all of the contractors involved know who the people are involved um, and give them resources so they can um, do what they're supposed to be doing correctly. Um, it also, you know, increases the attention to details that sometimes may be neglected on a typical new home construction, um, reduce thermal bridging, air sealing, quality installed insulation, um, a lot of the stuff that's covered in the Raider checklist. So, um, you know, not to say that this stuff isn't being done on most new homes, but this sort of verifies and, and makes sure that it's not forgotten. Um, and then lastly, the, the additional testing um, to ensure that, you know, the heating and cooling was done correctly, that the air sealing was done correctly. Um, we do blower door testing on all new construction homes, um, but we don't test exhaust flows. We don't balance pressure test bedrooms. Um, those are two tests that Energy Star does require above and beyond. Um, and just very quickly, exhaust flow measurements, I'm talking about bath bathroom exhaust fans, um, kitchen range hoods, um, and then also um, the bedroom pressure balance testing. We're 
making sure that a bedroom isn't going to get more air than it can, it's not going to be supplied more air than can leave that space. And, and what that can do is if you have a system that's pressurizing a bedroom, um, well, you could create some moisture issues with forcing moisture into your exterior walls. Um, there could be comfort issues or you could be overworking your furnace as well. So we make sure that those bedrooms aren't pressurized or depressurized. Um, and then the, the ventilation, we also measure the, the balanced ventilation system to make sure that that's actually working correctly, um, that it is operational. So um, I guess uh, with that, we can go to the next slide, Alyssa. So this particular home, 421 Ninth Avenue, um, this is a picture of the HERS certificate. So this is completed, and I guess I didn't touch on this, but we do these HERS ratings using an energy modeling software. Um, and that software takes into account anything that would impact energy efficiency. So obviously insulation, heating and cooling systems, appliances, lighting, the air tightness of the home, um, the size of the home, obviously, how many people are living there, um, but it is a prediction, it's an estimate. We don't know how those people, what their behaviors will be once they live there. So these are estimates, but you can see here that the HERS score on this house uh, was a 42. Um, the blower door test was 0 0.97 air changes per hour at 50 pascals. So that's um, very good. Um, anytime we see a score under, under one, um, we consider that a very tight home, which um, really just means that the ventilation is that much more important. Um, the other thing I'll point out on this chart is the estimated cost of gas and electric, so your utility bills, which are based on current local utility rates. So um, this house in an annual, um, I guess, term would be, uh, it would cost $1,295. So a lot of um, questions related to affordability can can look at this and see, you know, is it affordable to actually live there, not to not necessarily to pay for the house? So um, I think you can go to the next slide, Alyssa. So I just wanted to put this back in and just kind of give you an idea on where this house fell on the index and compared to some of our like historical data. So you can see in an average um, score, uh, right now we're in that 48, 49, upper 40s range, and we're at at 42 for this house, so um, that's quite good. And, and again, we didn't change um, the major components of this house in terms of energy. They're, they're using the same insulation um, and heating and cooling systems as you know 95% of the homes being built on the market right now. The other thing I'll point out is um, the blower door. You can see the average score um, over the last five years, right now we're in the upper, like around one, one and three quarters area, and this house was under one. So you can you can tell that this is above average in terms of air tightness. Okay, we can go to the next slide. So just kind of in closing on the performance side of things, um, just some of the takeaways I see, I guess, is that we exceeded the energy efficiency by using mainstream practices and standards, um, but done with um, attention to detail. Um, and they, they're little things, but sometimes they impact a lot. So um, something as simple as sealing up a framing joint or um, how like spray foam insulation is applied so that it encapsulates um, one of the major leakage points on a home, which is your sill plate resting on your foundation wall. Um, another thing that kind of is interesting and um, should should worry some people, I think, is that through the testing of the exhaust fans in this house, we identified that one of the bathroom exhaust fans dampers were screwed shut. And a lot of people take those fans kind of for granted. They can hear them running and they're, as long as you can hear it, they're running and they're working. But the actual uh, reality is they never perform even close to what they're designed for. Um, and if you don't actually do a, a test on a fan, you'll never know if it's actually working until you have a failure or a problem. So in this case, any moisture that that fan was going to be exhausting would basically dump right into that housing 
and probably ended up dripping into the attic or right back into the bathroom. So in this case, that test, you know, probably prevented some major issues down the road. Um, and then the last thing is just that, you know, going through Energy Star sort of forces trades and, and others that are involved to see things maybe a little differently. And hopefully that, you know, they take some of what they've learned and just apply it to future builds, whether they're Energy Star or not. Um, and we've, you know, we've seen buy-in from both HVAC contractors, insulators, carpenters, builders. So um, that's kind of our goal is to continue to educate the, the trades with some of these new practices. So that's, I guess I'll turn it over. I'm not sure who's speaking next, but that covers the home performance. Yeah, um, so I've, I'll try to be succinct because we're, I know being, I should be mindful of the time, um, but I've got a few takeaways that I was just gonna outline uh, quickly. Um, so is this concept affordable? Um, we need three things to continue to produce affordable housing. One is a tool like the CLT or the Community Land Trust to preserve affordability over the long term. Uh, two, philanthropy. Um, things like free money, cheap land, a land donation, um, grants from like Minnesota Housing or the City of Rochester through the Community Development Block Grant uh, program. And these resources are scarce, but it's also just a one-time uh, investment, so keep that in mind. Um, and the CLT resale process protects these investments um, by retaining the equity and, and holding that affordability. Um, and then number three, we need good partners like CRW and XRG and Maplewood and, uh, and um, the Coalition for Rochester Area Housing. And um, so, you know, is it affordable to buy it? Yeah, uh, you know, we showed you that the buyer was at 50% of AMI. And uh, is it affordable to build? Um, well, with the resources that we can tap into, yes. Um, so is this concept sustainable? Um, I would say yes, absolutely. Um, the, the buyer's um, feedback on this home is that they love the design. They've been surprised how low the utility bills are and they especially like all the windows and the open floor plan. And uh, you know, this project was unique because we actually got to design and build this home. Normally we're dealing with, uh, um, you know, we're acquiring a home toward the end of construction and we weren't able to be involved in design or we're having to match what was, you know, what the adjacent homes are, if it's in the townhome association, things like that. And uh, so because of this, we were able to provide a more thoughtful design and that focused on sustainability, and um, which I'm saying is longer, um, lower long-term maintenance and energy costs for that home buyer. And then um, is this concept scalable? Um, that's, that's kind of the million dollar question uh, right now. Um, and sort of put it out to all, you know, to the participants today to to really think hard about this one. Um, I would say that it it's possible, but it's not going to be without some compromises and changes in expectations, and definitely finding uh, better pricing on on land on on those lots. Um, we definitely can't build our way out of the lack of affordable housing. Um, it's going to be an all of the above uh, approach to solving the problem. And uh, some of the most affordable housing is already built and we need to preserve that and rehab those. And we also need to think outside the box in terms of building things um, in higher density neighborhoods and doing things again, like condos and co-ops. Um, so, um, and then lastly, what, what are some things we learned uh, through this project, well, we learned that uh, what realistic expectations look like around size of home, level of finish, and energy goals. Um, we learned that we, you know, we have a good plan to start from now, um, moving forward, you know, for the next project, and uh, you know, it's really just a matter of tweaking this plan to match 
whatever that next future project goal and level of funding is. We don't have to start from scratch and take three years. Um, and so we definitely will pick up some efficiency gains um, and save some time and resources on the next one. Um, but we did also learn that if we did, um, or for all of you that may be starting more from scratch, um, I encourage you to um, get the owner, the architect and the builder working collaboratively um, from the start. And you can really shorten um, that learning curve and in that time frame as you're modifying your design. Okay, I'll jump back on here. It looks like there are two questions that got posted into the chat. The first is, is the land trust service area a 35 mile radius? Would Preston be eligible? Um, yeah, okay, yes, it is a 35 mile radius. And I don't know off the top of my head how far Preston is. I feel like it's just outside of that. Um, but it's, if it's inside that, it's something, yes, we'd love to look at. Um, we're definitely looking for all the time, looking for partners and communities that are open to helping us find some of those philanthropy, um, things like, um, lower cost on land and, um, partnering on developing, um, you know, new in infrastructure. So. I guess I don't know who posed the question, but I would say follow up with me uh, and we can talk more about if Preston is in your your in our uh, service area. Great. And it looks like your contact information is shown on the slide there. Uh, the next question would be for Brandon at XRG Concepts. How much does the rating process cost? I was kind of wondering if someone would ask that. Um, so for what we're doing, um, there's kind of two components, the HERS rating itself, and then also the Energy Star certification process. So the HERS rating, um, kind of like a cost on just a rating on a typical home in our area would be $750. Um, and I'd, I'd say that also, um, and, and mention that there's a lot of utility rebates and programs that in some, time, in some cases will cover the cost of a HERS rating, which in the case of this home, it did. Um, and in other cases, um, and there was rebates involved with that as well, that program. And in other utility situations, they um, they have rebates that are pretty substantial that typically um, offset our fees or our costs to the builder for the HERS rating. Um, the Energy Star certification, um, that's a little bit harder to to state uh, what the cost is I, I just wrote down five hundred dollars as a rule of thumb for that um, but that would just be kind of the additional testing in, in our role as a rater in the process um, of course there might be other costs involved um, but um, that's kind of a good budget number for a single family home in our area okay a few other questions came in did you guys look at sip wall as an option Was that SIP wall, like structural insulated panels? Yes. Um, maybe Alyssa and Brandon could jump in there, possibly before I, I get involved. I can tell you when we first started design conversations, you know, two years ago, I think it was, um, everything was on the table. Um, SIP walls, superior walls, exterior foam insulation, ICFs. Um, pretty much any wall system that we know of is in terms of like high performance or, or increased insulation values we we discussed um, I do not believe that that it, it will sit sit panels in particular made it to the the budget um, phase of things and I don't know when you guys did your bids if if any of those alternate alternate walls um, were priced or not, I guess. So yeah, I, I can't answer that. The 
in the first round of, of proposals, we were looking, I, th I think, at, if I remember right, all or 100% um, spray foam insulation. Um, and ultimately, that was an area where um, there was a pretty large price tag attached to it. So, yeah, where we settled out was, I think, a good balance in, um, in keeping the cost down, but still having um, a decent performing insulated um, envelope. Okay. Um, did you consider just using the HRV and no exhaust fans? I'll, I'll take there's, that one, I guess. Um, another question related to fans that I'll quickly just say, so maybe you can answer them both. Sure. Um, do the bath fans go back through the air-to-air -air heat exchangers? Do the residents feel this is adequate? Do Does the furnace fan 24-7 and air exchanger 24-7? Sure, so kind of maybe I'll just explain the entire ventilation for this home. And I obviously didn't design it or anything. It meets, it meets code minimum. That's what it does. Um, but uh, so the bath fans are independent fans that handle moisture and odor in bathrooms. So that's that's their main task. So when the bathroom um, has a high moisture level, they should be running. Um, so the HRV, which is its main goal, is to bring fresh air for occupants into the home. That's interlocked with the furnace. So whenever the HRV is running, the furnace fan is running as well. And the fresh air is going to be, and, and the stale air for the HRV is going to be tied directly into the return and the supply of the, the air distribution for the furnace. And that's how fresh air is supplied to the house um, and how stale air is removed when it comes to fresh air. Um, so the question about, I believe what they're asking is, was the HRV used in a point source? configuration where the stale air was actually being taken from bathrooms um, or high moisture areas which we do see in new construction um, that was not the way this was configured um, and I, that is an option and a way to do that um, there's kind of mixed reviews on whether that's an effective way to do it or not um, and it can potentially reduce costs um, you have um, additional ductwork to get to those locations, but you don't have the cost of the bath fan. And, and so maybe there's a, a cost trade-off, but performance-wise, um, I, I would not recommend relying on an HRV or, or an ERV to remove moisture um, on a daily basis. Um, I would I would let the bath fan take care of that. So hopefully I answered those questions for you. You can email me too if you have more ventilation related questions. Um, another was, does this have central AC? Yes. And then um, what have been the real costs for energy the first year, which I'm assuming we don't know yet. Yeah, we don't. Um, they moved in <laughs> end of June. We do have about five months of data which is just sort of like too early to tell um sure yeah we and we then, talked about putting the, the actual costs in the presentation but um without having a full heating and cooling season to draw from it would probably just skew one way and, and not be it'd be misleading so we decided to omit that but hope, hopefully we can um, get that information at some point, Justin, and, and compare. Yeah, we definitely can. I mean, the homeowner is very, um, very cooperative with, with us. So um, I'm happy to keep in contact with him and uh, I guess somehow keep track of that. I don't know what sort of form we want to bring that back into, but I'm happy to, to help. Yeah. Um, and the last few questions sorry i just wanted to make sure we're 
respectful of the time here, were mm -hmm. directed towards Denny. Um, are you building to these standards now? It appears to replicate this house at market rate. We would it would be well over three hundred thousand, correct? And then also, um, someone said like the zero entry. Did this require a lift pump for sewer connection? So the question, the first question to that, um, or the first answer to that question, uh, if are we building to these standards? We thrive on. Uh, building to improve our energy uh, performance of all of our homes that we do. Um, this, the advanced framing is nothing new to most construction techniques. Uh, it's just a matter of implementing a little extra effort to accomplish that. And it's advisable to try to eliminate any thermal bridging when possible. The question about the zero entry into a lift pump, um, is not necessary in most cases to have a lift pump if the or sewer is in the right depth at, let's say, on a city level, for example. Uh, and most sewer applications are not altered to do a zero entry. It's mostly in the way of uh, elevations. As you can see on this picture, under the question picture, basically bringing that elevation up and then trying to follow um, the grade down so that you have um, attainable uh, ramping system, you know, within the code of that. So again, minimal effort uh, on most parts um, are doable in, in all applications. I hope I answered that question. Okay. And the last one, I guess, might be harder to answer, but about replicating this at market rate would cost over 300,000, correct? Well, yes. I mean, market rates are all over the place as everyone's probably heard that the lumber pricing in particular is so volatile right now that we are currently pricing um, at at current market conditions and only honoring that for a short period of time until we can get a stable market. But definitely it's over 300,000 on a market um, level, yes. Okay, that looks to be all of the questions. I want to thank everyone for joining today and hopefully you got something out of this and uh, have a great rest of your day. And just a reminder, we will be uh, posting a recording of this webinar on our YouTube channel. Uh, if you uh, had somebody uh, miss it, uh, it will be available shortly. Have a great day. Thanks, everybody. Thank you.